Hey, I made a multiplayer game in 4 days for a game jam and I'll take you through it. Multiplayer is hard, but I work at Coherence where we are working on tools that drastically simplify the multiplayer bits of making a game. Ever so often, we have an internal game jam where everyone is given a week to make anything they want. It just needs to use Coherence. This dogfooding usually uncovers a bunch of things that we can then improve. One such game jam happened last month and I made Sticky Robbers. It is directly inspired from another game that I played called Sticky Cats, which is a couch co-op game about, well, sticky cats that are trying to steal fish and it is a hilarious race to be the first. I'm imagining more bipedal ragdolls that jump in particular directions and try to get to a goal and then get back to the portal. Sounds easy. Let's do the single player version first. Day 1 I began by creating the player character first. Creating a ragdoll in Unity is usually about having a bunch of hinge joints connected to each other. So, I created a body and then four limbs. All of them have rigid bodies and box colliders on them. Then I attached a hinge joint to the ends of the limbs and connected it to the body. Finally, a circle for a head, again with rigid body and collider, with a hinge joint at the neck. Also, free googly eyes because I added hinges to the eyeballs. Oh yeah. Player movement should be easy. Figure out which direction you're trying to go, and then when you press space, add an impulse force to the body. Let's make that configurable as well so that we can vary the jump distance. This looks ridiculous enough. Now, about the sticky bits. We want to hang off of things that we hit. The simplest way to do that would be to create hinge joints with whatever you collide with. I'll create a mono behavior called sticker that does this. On collider enter, we set the rigid body of the second hinge to the body it just encountered. Let's tag the body with the body tag and the eyes with the eye tag so that this script does not stick the limbs to each other or to our own body. Now we attach this script to all the limbs and to the head. We also want to reset this when jumping. I'll add a small timer to keep track of the last reset and disable all hinges before applying the impulse. Let's create some walls and a level that our player can stick to and test it out. Look at that go. Awesome. Now, let's add the treasure that the player is trying to steal in the level. It's just another circle collider and we add a treasure script to it. The treasure script attaches its own spring joint to any collider that touches it. This way, if a player touches the object when it's being carried by another player, they will automatically get the treasure attached to them. Day 2 Okay, time to make this multiplayer. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video. I begin by importing the latest release into the project and follow the steps on the welcome screen. Create a new project on the Coherence dashboard and return to Unity and add a bridge and live query to the scene. The bridge is like the networking center for the scene. It manages incoming updates and sends updates from your client to the others. The live query object controls what you can see in your game. Let's set it to zero since you can basically see the whole level all the time. Let's begin by networking the player. To do this, I add a coherence sync script to my player prefab. I want to sync the position and the rotation of the body and all the limbs of this object. I go into the configure window and now clicking on the body, I can select the position and rotation to sync. I can also click on the nested children of the prefab and sync the position and rotation of those two. Oh, and the eyes. Heck, why not? Let's sync that too. I also want to disable the player script on other clients that join. I only want my player to jump when I press space. Similarly, I also set the rigid bodies to be kinematic for everyone else so that their movements are driven by the incoming network updates instead of the physics of the local scene. The UI is telling me that I need to bake to get optimized codes for this. Let's do it. That generates a bunch of code that is optimized for the current selection of variables that I decided to sync and generates a schema that holds this information. I'll also push the schema to the Coherence Cloud. To connect to the servers, I use the sample UI dialogs that allow you to join a session. I went with the lobby dialog that lets player find each other and join a session together. All of this is easy to create on your own if you read the documentation for the UI and create customized versions of this, but the sample UI is good enough for the game jam. Let's play. Create the lobby, join, and we are connected. Of course, we need a build to check this out for real. Build time. Aha, I see that it completely breaks if the players spawn inside each other. 
We need to spawn them away from each other. Let's create some spawn points. Also, a match handler that will control where the players are spawned. The way I decided to solve this was basically that the match handler subscribes to a callback from the bridge that tells it when anyone else has joined. The match handler is a unique and persistent object that lives in the scene. This ensures that there's only a single match handler for the whole session. I also enabled client connections in the bridge so that the match handler gets this callback. Now whenever a new player joins, this callback is triggered. The match handler keeps track of used spawn points and then instantiates a player on the unused spawn points. This ensures that the players are spawned away from each other. This new player is actually on the client that owns the unique match handler. I just transfer it to the newly joined client immediately. This is possible due to the distributed authority that Coherence supports. Basically, the ownership of the network objects can be controlled by scripts. Transferring the ownership to the newly joined clients leads to the new client having a player that it can control but spawned by someone else. Much better. Look at them go. Oh wait, we should also allow sticking to each other. Hmm. Right now, they don't stick to anything with the body tag, so they don't stick to each other. We can fix that by having a reference to the player object in the sticker scripts. If we hit something with the body tag and it also has the same player object, then don't stick to it. We just don't want to stick to ourselves, but others are fair game. The treasure scripts also need some modifications. We already stick using the spring joint, but we should also transfer ownership when we do so. The treasure is set to steal, which means anyone can claim ownership of it. Let's add that to the sticker objects. If we collide with the treasure tagged object, let's request ownership of it. The steal version automatically transfers ownership to anyone asking for it. Day three. I then spent some time setting up the actual level. I found this home interior game asset and I just reused the existing room scene for the game. I did add rigid bodies and colliders to every object. Also, I realized that it would be nice if we could stick and cause some of the objects to tumble. So I made these rigid bodies dynamic with a gravity of zero for some added a, and added a coherent sync to them. I made them all unique and persistent as well. This way, there's only one of them in the scene and turning on auto adopt meant that some client in the scene will be running their physics. I would like that the currently sticking player runs their physics for maximum accuracy. So I use the steel mechanic again and I just ask for ownership if I collide with them within a time frame. This is looking good. The final part of the puzzle is actually having a game loop. We want the players to be able to stick to the treasure and enter the portal. I added a synced variable to the match handler that tracks the current owner of the treasure. This is done through commands, which are basically RPCs on the match handler object to set the current owner's name. Now, when a player collides with the treasure, it calls matchhandler.sync.send command, set current treasure owner with its own name, which triggers the function on the remote client's match handler and sets the name. Name is synced across all clients. Finally, I made the portal a synced object as well, making it unique and persistent with auto adopt. When a player collides with the portal, it calls a command on the match handler called game over and sets the target to all. This means that this function is called for owned as well as networked match handlers on all clients. This function checks if the current treasure holder is the same as the one that this function was called with. And if it is, then it shows the game over UI with the name of the winning player on all clients. Game loop done. Day four. There's a lot that can be done with this game to make it better especially around the game loop, but I decided to focus on the optimizations instead. Per player object, there are about six transforms being synced. That's a lot of positions in rotation. But the great thing is that we know that the positions are within a certain range. Going into the optimize window, I can set the range of the expected positions. And I do a similar thing with the rotations, reducing their precision. I really don't need 0.001 precision for my rotation. 0.1 is good enough for this game. This reduces the bandwidth used by a lot, nearly 50% of the original. The demo was in the afternoon and I spent most of day four just playtesting and fixing tiny bugs. So there you have it. You can play the game in the link in the description box. It's running on the free credits per month and I hope this video gets popular enough for me to max out the limits of the free tier. It's quite hard to hit the max though. Let's see. See you in the next one.